Well, on Sunday mornings, we've been doing a series through the book of Genesis, but as we come to these verses that talk about man being created in the image of God, this topic is so important that what I want to do for, I don't know, the next two or three weeks, maybe four weeks, is, is just step out of Genesis chapter 1 and just do a series on the image of God and unpack what this is and what it means for us. Because the biblical idea of the image of God, which in Latin is called the imago Dei, so if you want to impress your friends at a Christian party, you can just talk about the imago Dei and they'll think you're smart. The imago Dei is an incredibly relevant idea for today because what it deals with is it deals with the fundamental question, what are human beings? And I think this is an incredibly important topic for today. Because what are we? What are human beings? Are we a cosmic accident? Are we the byproduct of random chance and natural selection? Are we just a series of fortunate mutations, a series of happy accidents? Are we just highly evolved animals? Are we amino acid chains that have evolved over time into these highly complex beings? If human beings are 96% genetically identical to a chimpanzee, then what makes a human being different than a chimpanzee? Why are they still living in trees and we're living in condos in Midtown? Amen? Like, what's the difference? Why are we so much more advanced than they are? Here's another question. Is consciousness and our sense of self just an illusion created by chemical processes in our brain? If you want to read something that will really kind of weird you out, is read about the consciousness of octopuses. That's That's this whole new thing that's emerged right now. I was at the Strand yesterday with my dad, and I was reading this book about the consciousness of octopus and actually how incredibly smart they are. They have one of the largest nervous systems of any animal in the world. Their eye is similar to ours, and they're a mollusk. They're basically like like a they're like a clam on steroids. They're like this super smart (laughs) animal that scientists right now are totally tripped out by, and they seem to have some level of consciousness. Well, what separates us from the octopuses? And then another question is, why are we here? What's our role in the world? What does it mean to be human? Well, look at this quote by Emil Brunner. He was a famous 20th century Swiss theologian, and he wrote this. He says, the most powerful of all spiritual forces is man's view of himself. The way in which he understands his nature and his destiny, indeed it is, indeed it is the one force which determines all the others which influence human life. And he's right, because your view of yourself determines everything. And with the rise of supercomputers and smartphones and artificial intelligence and highly advanced robots, these questions are being wrestled with now more than ever. That's the theme behind Westworld and behind Blade Runner and Ex Machina. It's what does it mean to be human? In the most recent Blade Runner, spoiler alert, but that's what Ryan Gosling's character is trying to figure out through the whole movie. Is he a human being or is he a robot? And if he, is, if he is a robot, well, what does it mean to be real? What does it mean to be human? And really what it is, it's a 21st century retelling of Pinocchio. That's what it is. And Ryan Gosling is trying to figure out, am I a real boy or am I not a real boy? And then what does it mean to be a real boy? What does it mean to be a human being? Well, here's what's fascinating. Moses gave an answer to all of these questions thousands of years ago. And he addresses it right here in Genesis chapter 1. What are human beings? We are creatures made in the image of God. What makes us distinct from the other animals? We're the one animal that bears the image of God. And what's our role in the world? We've been called to rule over God's creation and to cultivate the earth. In theology, this is called the cultural mandate, and we'll we'll talk about this more in the coming weeks. But let's start by looking at our passage, and then over the coming weeks, we're going to unpack this and talk about what the image of God is and what its implications are for our lives. And it has implications for gender, for sexuality, for the meaning of marriage. It affects so many things, and we're going to talk about all those things in the coming weeks. And the, the real controversial ones, you've got to come for those. Those will be really fun. Okay, so, <laughs> but let's look at our passage. Today's kind of the PG one, and then it'll, it'll ramp up in the coming weeks. But let's read our passage And we're going to talk about it for a few minutes. Verses 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so what God does is, so God makes everything. He makes this beautiful, amazing world. And now on day six, he comes to his crowning creative act. He makes his masterpiece humankind. And human beings are his magnum opus. We're living, breathing sculptures that God has created. 
I love what the Dutch theologian Herman Boving writes about this. Look at this quote. He says, the entire world is a revelation of God, a mirror of his virtues and perfections. Every creature in his own way and according to his own measure, his own measure is an embodiment of divine thought. I think, that's, I think that's the best line. Like a squirrel was an idea in God's mind. And then an actual squirrel is the embodiment of a divine idea. God thought it up. He, you know, they would have a tail and big cheeks and everything. And then he created that. And that is the, an embodiment of a divine thought. But look at the last sentence. But among all the creatures, only man is the image of God, the highest and richest revelation of God, and therefore head and crown of the entire creation. Here's something also interesting to notice is that in the narrative leading up to this point, God has always talked about with the singular pronoun. It says, and he said, in, in every creative act to this point, but now as we come to verse 26, it switches to a plural pronoun. It says, let us make man in our image. And what this indicates is there's something radically different about the creation of humans. There's something radically different about human beings than the other animals. Because every, everything else up to this point, it was singular, but now it's plural. But it, here's something to think about is who is God talking to? He says, let us make man in our image. Well, who's God talking to? Who he's talking to is the Trinity. He's not talking to the angels. He's not talking to the heavenly court. This isn't a figure of speech. We will find out with later revelation in the New Testament that, listen to this, it's the members of the Godhead speaking to themselves. It's God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit dialoguing amongst themselves about the creation of human beings. And this is important. Because as Christians, we believe in one God, we're monotheists, but Christians believe in a very distinct God, a God unlike any other God in the world. We believe in what's called a trinity or a triunity. We believe in one God, we're monotheists, but we believe that within the one God, within the Godhead, are three persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, how that works, I actually have no idea, okay? And one theologian I read one time, he says, in every attempt to explain the trinity basically is heresy. So you can't even really try to explain it. It's just an article of faith that you have to just believe and accept. And I'm actually fine with that because I think if we're temporal beings coming into contact with an eternal being, there should be things that we can't understand. I think if we can completely understand everything, then maybe it's not true. But if there's these things we can't understand that seem beyond our capability, then to me, that is a rumor of the divine, that that hints that we're actually coming into contact with something that's bigger than ourselves. But here's the, here's the idea. But we believe that within the one God are three persons, that God is a community of persons. And so to be made in the image of God is to be made for community. And that's part of what it means to be a human being, that you're not fully human unless you're in community, unless you're in relationship with other people. But look what he says here. But he says, but let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, what's fascinating is that the passage actually doesn't even tell us what the image of God is. We actually don't even really know what the image of God is. It just makes this amazing statement, and then we're kind of left, well, what, 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 what's he talking about here? And so I think in order to understand what the image of God is, first of all, we have to look at the word that's translated image. We have to look at the context of Genesis 1, and then we have to look at the context of the times in which this passage was written. So the first thing, let's look, let's look at the word. What's the word for image? It's the Hebrew word tesselin, and I should have a slide for it. And tesselin, it's derived from a word that means to carve or to cut. And the word tesselin, this is fascinating, listen to this, was used for idols or statues or images. And so the idea is that God created human beings to be a physical representation of him in the world. God is invisible, and so we are created as human beings, listen to this, to be the visible, physical image of God on the earth. I'm going to give you another big, cool word that you can use at a Christian party. It's theomorphic. Humans are theomorphic. We are made in the image of God. And the image of God is more about our function than whatever attributes we have. Historically, when theologians speculate on the image of God, they thought, oh, it's because we have reason or it's because we're creative. But now we find that animals are creative and animals you know, do incredible things. So what is it about human beings that makes us distinct? It's, it's our function. It's our role. We were created to image God to the world. We were created to mirror him to the world, to reflect him to the world, to display him to the world, to show the visible world what the invisible God is like. So the invisible God wants to make a representation of himself, and what does he do? He creates human beings, and we are made in the image of God. J. Richard Middleton, he wrote this outstanding book about the image of God. It's called The Liberating Image. And look at this quote. The invisible God is imaged by bodily humanity. 
The Imago Dei designates the royal office or calling of human beings as God's representatives and agents in the world, granted authorized power to share in God's rule or administration of the earth's resources and creatures. Now, here's something fascinating, though, is that this idea of a person being the image of God actually wasn't a completely new idea. This wasn't, a, this wasn't an idea that was new, that was invented by Moses. In the ancient Near Eastern culture of Moses' day, the pagan kings called themselves the image of God. They claimed that they were the embodiment of God. It was this power move over everybody in the ancient world, that the king himself was the image of God. He was the embodiment of God, and so it gave him a power and authority greater than any other person. But what Moses does is he takes this idea of the image of God, and he democratizes it. He democratizes the idea. And he says it's not just the king who's the image of God. Every single human being is the image of God. I love what the Bible scholar Victor Hamilton says. He says, in God's eyes, all of mankind is royal. You know, as Americans, like, we don't have royalty, and so we're kind of fascinated by England. And then the recent wedding that happened, who were the two people that just got married? Yeah, Meghan Markle and, and Prince Harry. Well, we're all, I don't even know, we're all captivated as Americans, royalty, and we're like, but you know what the Bible says? We're all royalty. All of us are royalty. I mean, it's still kind of cool, but we're all royalty, all right? There's not first and second class citizens. There's not masters and slaves. There's not kings and peasants. There's not royalty and commoners. We are all made in the image of God, and that's what Moses is saying. We are all royalty. And so listen, because we are all made in the image of God, then all human life has value. Leaders and workers, the unborn, the disabled, the handicapped, the elderly, the immigrant, the refugee, the black, the white, the Asian, the Hispanic, the Native American or Pacific Islander, everybody's made in the image of God, so everybody has inherent value. And that's what I have to tell myself sometimes. When I get frustrated by somebody in New York City, like I get extremely frustrated, I go, they're made in the image of God, they're made in the image of God, <laughs> they're made in the image of God. And I have to tell myself that every human being has value because every single human being doesn't matter where they're from or what their background is or what their economic or educational level, they are made in the image of God, and so they have an inherent dignity about who they are. And these kings, what they would also do is they would set up images of themselves throughout their kingdoms. So you're a pagan king in the ancient Near Eastern world of Moses' day, and throughout your kingdom, you would set up these statues or images of yourself. And it was a way to project power across your kingdom and to show that you were the king over all your kingdom. And we see that today with Kim Jong-il in North Korea, and we see that with Chairman Mao in China. He set up pictures of himself all throughout China to, to show that he was the ruler over all of China. Well, the, in the Bible, God's doing the same thing. But you know what his image is? It's us. God is the king of creation, and we are his images on earth, representing his authority over the world. And so listen, so this is why we're not to make images of God or to worship images of God, because we are the image of God. Isn't that fascinating? We don't make idols because, in a sense, we are the idol. We don't make images of God because we are the image of God. It's like you're demeaning yourself. You're worshiping something that's less than you when you are the image of God. Listen to what the German theologian Gerhard Gerhard von Rad wrote, which is, a, is an amazing name, okay? <laughs> Gerhard von Rad. <laughs> I'd make you say that, but you're all a little tired this morning. Gerhard von Rad. Look at what he writes. Just as power for earthly kings to indicate their claim to dominion, erect an image of themselves in the provinces of the empire where they do not personally appear, so man is placed upon earth in God's image as God's sovereign emblem. Isn't that fascinating? And listen, I want you to hear this too. You know what? And this is the truest thing about you. Notice the chronology here. Before God talks about our gender, before he talks about our sexuality, before he talks about what we are or what we do, he says we are made in his image. This is the deepest truth about us. This is the truest thing about who you are. This, this is at the, the deepest core of your identity, deeper than your gender, deeper than your sexuality, deeper than the color of your skin, deeper than your net worth, deeper than the country you were born in, you are the image of God. And this unites all of us together as human beings. What's the common ground that we could somehow find in our world for every human being to get along? We are all made in the image of God. Every single human being is made in the image of God. And on that basis alone, I can be united to any other person in the world. But here's the thing, though. But though we were created in God's image to be his physical representatives in the world, we sinned and fell. And the image of God in us was damaged and corrupted by the fall. 
I don't think we lost the image of God. I just think it was, it was marred. But here's the gospel. Here's the good news. But where we failed, Jesus succeeded. Amen? And being the actual embodiment of God in a way that we're not because Jesus was God in human flesh, Jesus is the supreme image of God. He's the, he's the supreme physical representation of God. We're the image of God with a lowercase i. Jesus is the image of God with an uppercase i. He's the image of God par excellence. He's the perfect image of God. I got one more quote for you. It's by Anthony Hokema. And look, look at what he writes. I want you to look at this quote. Since Christ was totally without sin, in Christ we see the image of God in its perfection. I love this. He says, as a skillful teacher uses visual aids to help his or her pupils understand what is being taught, so God the Father has given us in Jesus Christ a visual example, example of what the image of God is. There's no better way of seeing the image of God than to look at Jesus Christ. And if it's true that Christ perfectly images God, then the heart of the image of God must be love, for no man ever loved as Christ loved. Man, you want psychological healing, you want emotional healing, you want to transform the way you see reality, meditate on the fact that the God of the universe is just as loving as Jesus Christ. Walk through life with that perspective. Walk through, because we don't believe that. We don't, you know, I, was, I brought up the message last week and I was talking to somebody about it. You know what the big lie is? The big lie is that God is not good. Is that God is not good. And that's what Satan is constantly trying to tell us. That's what our flesh is tr constantly trying to tell us. And when you live in a world where you don't think God is good, you live very different than in a world where, where you know that God is good. And the God of the universe is just as loving as Jesus Christ. And look, we see this all over the New Testament. Colossians 1.15, the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. Hebrews 1.3, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. And then what happens is when we become Christians, as God conforms us into the image of Jesus as Jesus followers, what he's doing, listen to this, is he's conforming us more and more into the image of God. What God is doing through Jesus and through our surrendering our lives to Jesus is he's restoring the image of God in us. The image of God that was damaged by the fall is being renewed as we follow Jesus. Listen to these two verses, 2 Corinthians 3.18. And we all with unveiled face beholding the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image for one degree of glory to another, for that comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. And Romans 8.29, which is an outstanding verse. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son so that he would be the firstborn among many brothers. And what happens is as we follow Jesus, this is an ongoing, progressive work of the Holy Spirit on us, and it never ends until we die and we're glorified. And that's kind of exciting. You know, there's no stage of your life where the Holy Spirit's done with you. Every season of your life, he's, he's making you more and more and more and more like Jesus. And it will just go on and on, and you'll, you'll learn new things about Christ. You'll become more humble and more loving and more filled with God's Spirit. The older you get, the longer you walk with Him until we get to heaven. And then that process is complete in an instant. And in theology, that's called glorification. But notice also what it says. And you've got you to look at all these little things, right? It also says that we were created in his image and his likeness. And I think that this is designed to exalt us and humble us at the same time. It exalts us in saying we're made in the image of God, which is pretty amazing. We're not just animals. We're not just cosmic accidents. We are special creatures, we're special creatures made in the image of God. You know, I remember the first time I heard about evolution, I was in ninth grade, and I just remember being kind of rattled by it. I just thinking, I'm just a monkey? Like, I'm just an animal? And I think what that does to your sense of self, you're just like, well, if I'm an animal, then I'll just live like an animal. But if there's something different about us, if we're made in the image of God, all of a sudden, all the negative voices in your head that are always criticizing you and beating you down and all those things, all of a sudden, it's, it's turned on its head. Wait a minute, I'm the image of God. I'm made in the image of God. That is pretty amazing. We are special creatures made in the image of God, and we should embrace that part of our identity. But we're made in his likeness. We're not God. We're like him, but we're not God. So it exalts us. We're made in the image of God, but we're just like him. We're not God. He's God, and so we're to worship and serve him as God. 
Notice also, look what it says in verse 27. It says, and he made them in the image of God, male and female he made them. Well, again, this is a radical idea. It's not just men that are made in the image of God. Women are made in the image of God as well. Amen? <laughs> and this gives women equal value and equal importance. And you've got to understand, Moses wrote this probably about 3,000 years ago. This is incredibly progressive for somebody 3,000 years ago. Amen? And Moses is saying that because women are made in the image of God, just like men, they have just as much value and they're equally important as men are. Women are just as much the image of God as men. And so they're, they're to be given all the respect and dignity and equality that bearing the image of God brings. And so we see what we are as humans. What are we as humans? This question that's being wrestled with that Westworld is talking about and Blade Runner and Ex Machina and everyone's discussing, Moses answers that question, what is a human being? We are the image of God. And what is our role? We're to exercise dominion. We're to rule over the world as kings and queens. And so this is what God does. He creates the world, and then he places man in it to rule over it and to subdue it. And actually, the word for subdue, it means to cultivate, and we're going to talk about that more in a minute. And that's where the idea of the cultural mandate comes from, that we were, we're, we're called by God to make and build and create and to take all the raw materials of creation and make them into amazing things. But we're to rule over the world as God's vice regents, as his appointed kings and queens. He's the supreme king. He's the king of kings. But we're his under kings, appointed by him to exercise dominion over the world. And I'm going to develop this idea more in the coming weeks. But I want to close with three applications, and I want you to write these down, all right? The first is we were created to image God to the world. We were created to image God to the world. We're to show the world what God is like. We're to make the invisible God visible. We're to mirror him to the world. We're to reflect him to the world. And Jesus was our supreme model in this. Jesus told his disciples, well, I back it up even just a little bit. One day Jesus' disciples, they say, Lord, show us the Father. Jesus, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus, I only do that which I see the Father doing. He perfectly modeled what the Father was like to the world. And so if you want to see God, if you want to know what God is like, all you have to do is look at Jesus. You want to know what God is like? After church, go home, pick up your Bible, read through the Gospels, and as you look at Jesus, you're seeing God. You're seeing exactly what God is like. How did God treat people? How did God act? What would it be like if God became a human being? That's what Jesus is. And so we are called to follow Jesus' example and do the same thing, and we're called just to do it to the best of our ability. Now, we're going to fail. Do every day of my life I perfectly image God to the world? Absolutely not. Yesterday, I was at a taco place with my dad and, and some guy... He was being a legitimate jerk, right? But some guy was a jerk to me, and I got kind of hot with him, and then my dad kind of stepped in. I was, like, ready to roll, you know? And, <laughs> and this guy was about two feet bigger than me, but I was, I mean, I was just, like, if I wasn't a pastor and a Christian, you know, it was like, but you know what? I got angry in a way that Jesus would not have gotten angry. Jesus would have been the bigger man. I would have went, okay, all right, whatever, you know? But I was, like, ready to roll because I'm little and Irish, and, you know, so. So do I always mirror God to the world perfectly? No. Do I always image God to the world perfectly? No. I'd say probably 90% of the time I fail at it. But 10% of the time, <laughs> I get it right. And I think I'm a little better now than I was 26 years ago when I first became a Christian, and I'll be a little better tomorrow. But that's kind of exciting, isn't that? We're to image God to the world. We're, we're, to, we're, to, we're to show the physical world what the invisible God is like. We're to make the invisible God visible by the way we live our lives. You know, I think one of the greatest arguments for the reality of God is church, especially church in the 21st century, especially a church of young people in a ballroom on a Sunday morning at Union Square. You guys could be sleeping in right now. You're like, I kind of wish I was. I could be watching Netflix. You could be having brunch with your friends, but you've chosen to gather together to worship Jesus and to study his word, and I believe that the church itself is actually an argument for the existence of God. I think that a community of people who are bound together by nothing but a love for Jesus, to me, is probably the most powerful apologetic in, in the world of the reality of God. And that's why the church is called the body of Christ. Together, as we love one another from all of our different backgrounds and differences, we come together in the name of Jesus. To me, I think that's probably one of the most powerful arguments for the reality of God. And so we're called to image God to the world. And when we mess up, like I messed up yesterday, then we confess it and we repent it and God forgives us and we just pick ourselves back up and we keep going and try to do better the next time. And we just do the best we can. But we are called to show the world what God is like. We're called to make the invisible God visible. 
Secondly, we were created to live in community. We were created to live in community. Being made in the image of God, who is a trinity, who is a community of persons, we were made for community. We need other people. We need friends. We need relationships. You know, I always talk about it when you're in prison. If you really get in trouble, how do they punish you? They put you in solitary confinement, which if you were in prison, would sound, it, that would sound amazing. I get to be completely by myself. No, it's rad for about 12, 13 hours, and then you start going insane because a human being begins to die when they're not in relationship with other people. You know, there's a story of the babies that would be in the orphanages in Romania during, when it was under communist rule, and there'd be these little babies that would die, not because they didn't have enough food, not because they didn't have enough water, but because no one held them or loved them or touched them. We're so weird, you know? You can, you can put a baby in a perfectly fine bed and give it all the food and water it needs, but if you don't touch it and love it and hug it, if it doesn't have interaction with another human, it'll just die. And all you are is a big baby, amen? <laughs> That's all you are. Yeah, I need that too. I need to be loved and touched and held, and, and I need a bed and food and water and all those other things. You know, we all need that. It's not weak. It's not a crutch. It's the image of God. You can't follow Jesus Christ on your own. You can't be a Christian on your own. You have to find community. And sometimes I think that's part of the danger of some of the churches in New York City that, you know, we're a little one that are so massive, is the city's massive, your church is massive, and then you go from having no community in your city, you have no community at your church, and then you wonder why you're struggling as a follower of Jesus because you have no community. And I was a part of a church like that in San Diego, and that's why I determined if I ever pastored a church, community would be one of our values. That church would feel like a family. Because, man, you can't do it on your own. And sometimes I think the churches that have all these accountability groups, that's really some weird, unhealthy reaction to the natural accountability that should happen when people are doing life together as Jesus followers. Amen? You don't need all these weird support groups. I don't think you need therapists and counselors. You just get that free from your friends. Amen? Sometimes what you're getting from a counselor is you're just paying someone to be your friend and listen to you because no one listens to each other anymore. You see people eating out. Everyone's on their smartphones. Put the smartphone down and have a conversation with somebody, and you'll save them a lot of money on therapists. Okay? So... And I believe in therapists. I'm not attacking that. I'm just saying that sometimes you just really need someone to talk to. You just need a friend. And lastly, we were created to exercise dominion. God made us to be kings and queens. He made us to rule. But when we're enslaved to something, we're not rulers anymore. We're slaves. We're not called to be slaves. We're called to be kings and queens. And not just a handful of people in the UK, we're all called to be kings and queens. Through Jesus Christ, God has set us free. He's conquered all of our enemies, and we don't have to be enslaved to anything any longer. When you're afraid, fear is ruling over you. When you're addicted to something, that addiction is ruling over you. You know, what's interesting is Adam was called to rule over the natural world, but the people who were addicted to the the different things in the natural world, you know what's you know, ironic? They've actually, that, that thing that they're addicted to, that drug or whatever, that, that plant that God has made is actually ruling over them. Isn't that weird? Isn't that, that some weird inversion? We were called to rule over the plant, but when you're addicted to some plant, that plant is actually ruling over you. It's got power over you. When we're controlled by lust, lust is ruling over us. Paul says, whatever you obey, you become its slave. But through Jesus, God has given us a victory He's restored us. He's made us kings and queens with him. And he doesn't want us to be slaves to anything any longer. And through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit, you do not have to be a slave to anything any longer. And he calls us to exercise dominion, the original dominion that we had at the very beginning in the Garden of Eden. And we're to have victory over everything in our lives. Amen? But here's the last thing I want to say is, but the only way that the image of God can begin to be restored in you is through surrendering your life to Jesus because he's the perfect image of God. And so first of all, what he does is he gives you the model and then when you surrender your life to him, he fills you with the Holy Spirit and God now gives you the ability to exercise dominion. He, he gives you the ability to mirror him to the world. But without the Holy Spirit, without surrendering your life to Christ, God can't do that in your life. So the question I have for you this morning is have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Have you ever given your heart to him? Well, I encourage you to do it this morning so that God can begin to restore the image of God in you. Amen? Let's pray.